Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. And welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of Syosset Library. I'm your host today, Jen, and I'm here with the writer of an absolutely enthralling and engaging novella that I could not put down. Could I please ask you to introduce yourself and your book, please? Absolutely. My name is Zach Rosenberg, and I am the author of Hungers as Old as This Land. Ugh, such a good title. Could you talk a little bit first like about where that title came from? Because it's so good. <laughs> Certainly. This actually start, started as a short story, and um, my idea for theme was kind of, you know, the violence of the West, manifest destiny, um, the hunger for profit and expansion, and contrasting that to the more, you know, primal hungers of, spoiler alert, the monsters in the novel, or the novella, and basically how that contrasted, and the idea of greed being such an old hunger, that it really, you know, that has always been there as long as there's been land to exploit um, by things like manifest destiny and colonialism. That it really just kind of flowed from there. Originally, it was uh, it was going to be uh, what built this land, but I wasn't really happy with that. So, mm-hmm. much like I settled on hungers as old as this land, and the expansion really just happened from there. Nice, yeah. It is. Um, it, it's really remarkable how. Um, you fit so much story into a very tight package, like it's remarkably efficient and it's very, uh, like very uh, captivating. It's very hard to put down. Um, but before we get into the book too much, could you talk a little bit perhaps about your journey to writing? Um, were you a fan of horror first or of Westerns? And like, how did these things come together for you? Like what brought you to this project? Definitely. Um, when, you know, I was really into horror since I was a kid. Um, I really got into it when I was like really little um I think I must have been like somewhere between seven and ten I can't remember which when I first got into one of them I think it was it came from beneath the sink and then I was just getting all like the kid horror books I could get my hands on I got a little older and I was getting more of them um and I would just always love to kind of like make up stories in my head um I really kind of stopped writing for like a little while for quite a long time actually just because I just kind of fell off it Mm. and I really got back into it like a few years ago uh Probably like 2017, 2018, I started writing my own stuff again and just, um, you know, just doing ran- just doing various things there and going and from there, it was uh, really uh, last year was when I really decided I was going to start writing and submitting and, you know, it really started working out a little. Nice. Like very quickly too, like you've had uh, just from following you on Twitter for a little while, you had like a bunch of really exciting announcements in what seems like a pretty short amount of time. And yeah, there's a lot of cool uh, stuff going on in your career and in this book. So let's talk about it. Like, could we start maybe a little bit um, with the main characters? Because I love Esther and Shaban so much and their relationship is like really lovely. And I also love the way that they both relate to the father. Um, Could you talk a little bit about like where this trio of characters came from and how you sort of like develop their dynamic? Absolutely. Um really, you know, it really came down to an idea of, I wanted characters who represented diversity in the Old West, um, characters who were, who, who would be marginalized. And I really wanted to tell some stories about, um, because I'm Jewish and I love, you know, and I love Jewish horror and Jewish fiction and Jewish fantasy. I want to tell those stories about, you know, Jewish people in the West um, who don't really get mentioned that much. Um, and I had the idea of also, you know, of Esther being um, half Jewish, half indigenous, Mm -hmm. Um, because I really wanted that representation in there. I really wanted to portray that as well as I could, Um, but also, you know, not to appropriate an Indigenous story and Indigenous folklore and Indigenous history, because I didn't feel that was my place to tell. But I also wanted, um, with Siobhan, you know, also I wanted a character who was Jewish, who could, you know, who, you know, Esther is born Jewish, and, you know, her descent of Judaism is patrilineal, which would be unconventional in some places. There's, There's actually some controversy about that in Jewish communities, because the very traditional side is matrilineal so she would have been raised a little unconventionally in that faith through her father um and siobhan is a convert but she's never treated as anything but jewish and i wanted to you know show that that you know once someone has converted they are for all intents and purposes 100 percent jewish and in fact um jewish law the halakha says that 
you are actually not even supposed to ever bring up there was a time they, they weren't Jewish at that point. And also Siobhan is someone, you know, she's um she, you know, she's the daughter of an Irish immigrant and she is someone who would be considered on once again on the lower rung of the ladder, but not to the same extent as others. And that kind of feeds into kind of her devil may care outlook. Um she sometimes takes a few things for granted that she um that she kind of forgets that Esther has more to worry about than she does. Um their father, um, you know, Abraham, I really wanted a character who was, you know, honestly just a good father, a caring person, someone who tries to do the best for his community, who is not perfect and doesn't have all the answers, but has a lot of secrets at the same time, who's very good at making deals because he has apparently, you know, worked out something with unconventional creatures nearby. And also it meant a lot for me to portray him as a former Union soldier because a lot of times in the American Westerns, um, I kind of grew up, you know, I, I never really kind of got into a lot of like the John Wayne Westerns. There was just something about them I never really cared for. And so many of them kind of like promoted the, like so many of those Westerns from the time period promoted the idea of the noble Confederate, like the doom lost cause. And that just never sat right to me. So I really, um, it was really when I got into spaghetti Westerns a little later on that I really kind of started loving Westerns for what they, what they were and what they could be like the gothic westerns the revisionist westerns the more left-leaning ones the more uh kind of brutal ones in a sense like a uh, fistful of dollars blew me away the good the bad the ugly the great silence and i really wanted to portray a character who was you know an unapologetic union soldier who was someone who had fought for the north who believed in ending slavery um, and someone who was also, like I said, just a very loving father who was supportive of his daughter. And, I, and you know, obviously Esther and Siobhan are a couple, and it's a very, not very accepting time. I didn't really want to go into the homophobia too much there because I felt it would detract a little from kind of the anti-Semitism and the racism of the, of the time. Um, and obviously I was only, I only had so many pages to work with, but I kind of had the idea of, you know, there are people in the in the village who don't understand it or might not approve of it, but they're still, you know, they still don't really say much because Esther is the leader is the you know leader's daughter and also you know they are just able to kind of bluff and bribe their way out of you know any innkeepers who wonder why they're sharing a room or anything so it, it was really important for me to portray that just kind of caring relationships all around I really just came up with the characters after um some consideration and I just I just really loved writing them um I, I just really have a blast with with, with them as, as characters they, they they really just kind of grew on me as I went yeah, they're they're really wonderful and their relationships all feel very lived in and real, you know, and something that I found particularly fascinating. Um, this is going to seem totally irrelevant at first, but I promise it will <laughs> go back to something meaningful. <laughs> so before I became a librarian, I studied medieval history and I worked on women's intercultural and interreligious interactions because women actually tended to interact more across like religious and ethnic lines than men did because like women you know did errands outside the house like you know shopping shopping for food and you know interacting with other women and stuff like that and so it did feel very real too that that these women would come together for survival you know especially in places like you know the western frontier that were sort of on the edge of society where perhaps there was like a little bit more permissiveness or ability to kind of like live on the edges of things and not really like you know um call too much attention to yourselves um so I'd love that was like a very long intro <laughs> to this question which is could you talk a little bit about like yeah how the setting maybe like affects their relationship and like the um the horror that's all at the edges of this too because western is I think like westerns are a very fertile area for uh horror and there have been some really good ones but like not a ton and so i just love the combination of that two genres so you could talk about like what setting is doing here for our characters and like for the story absolutely um, you know it's, it's funny you mention that because one, one of my little pet peeves is when people use the historical excuse to portray you know characters or women with no or minorities or women with no agency um that's always bothered me because i consider it like extremely ahistorical because women have always been doing things in history uh women in you know, from way back, you know, even if obviously I'm not going to portray um, them as egalitarian paradises, but, you know, in the Middle Ages, um, women worked, they helped with businesses, they they were, you know, women rulers. And, and you know, I, um, part of the setting for me was it was very important for me to portray the people um, who are traditionally portrayed with less power and giving them more of it. Um, you know, like 
I love the good. I love um, the good, the bad, the ugly. I love um, Once Upon a Time in the West. Um, it's it's a movie I really adore. Um, and Jill in that movie is probably one of my favorite characters. But I think you know um, Sergio Leone did have kind of a misogynist bent, and that does come across a little in the movie, where you know she is a former sex worker that's you um, that's kind of treated as a dark secret in her past. Mm. Um, at one point, she is raped by the villain, and it you know she is. Ex- extremely strong um she you know gets beyond it but it's kind of it does reflect you know a bit of a problem with that i wanted to portray these characters as you know um basically people who were who had agency despite that time period and you know i find the west a very 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 fertile ground for horror because there's so much to it there's so much horrible things happening in the west there's manifest destiny there's racism, there's discrimination, there's lab- there's you know labor disputes, um, you have unchecked capitalism. And I, I, I've seen some really good uh, Western horror. I think you know probably the best, probably one of the best books I've read on that is Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy, which I will say is absolutely a horror book. It is just like the purest, rawest form of human violence. Um, one of my all-time favorites that I really took some, um, I really took some liberty, um, some cues from as well ravenous is one of my favorite horror movies that is just i i, I that's a great western it is like you know it, it i i think like i've heard you know kind of butchers the uh native myths and you know a little bit of history but I, that movie has no right to be as good as it is guy pierce robert, robert carlisle they're, they're just like it's even better when you realize they're basically improving everything and it's it, it's just a movie that shouldn't work and just totally does but it's the idea of like this whole westward expansion. This whole we are just going to take everything. Um, we are going to despoil everything we find. We are going to eliminate people who were here. We are going to set up these areas that basically operate on their own, you know, their own law systems. And I've really seen it done, you know, very, very, very well in other places. There, there's um, there's some good, you know, weird west things I've read. Like I, I grew up reading comics too. Like I loved uh, Jonah Hex and like some of the weird west uh, tales were always a lot of fun. Um, there was one relatively recent one called the burrowers which was uh oh yes it, 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 it's like it's a little hokey but it's kind of like the it's like the idea of like you know the the vicious drive and the, and the western expansion has killed like all the buffalo which these monsters that live underground would normally prey on and so now uh so now um they're preying on mankind instead it's like it, it's really like those ideas that um really gave me the thought of it and you know i just i just love the weird west and everything but I had the I had the idea of like you know what if the creatures are contrasted to like the, the, you know the more vicious greed of mankind and that sort of you know violence that was uh, something that was really important for me to portray like kind of the West don't shy away from its more brutal aspects don't shy away from the nastiness um, because um, you know like when the villain in his first scene um, in the present is introduced essentially they're mercenaries. And they're slaughtering a group of unionizers who want to, you know, who want safer working conditions for the bankers. And, you know, that's stuff that actually happened. You know, they are, like, I think that, you know, when, when you have monsters and, and everything, I think what, what I was trying to aim for in the setting was basically to give them that contrast. Mm-hmm. That is so interesting. I'm really glad that you brought up the human vill- villain uh, here because, uh Cyril's a great character. I mean, he's, he's you know, yeah. unconscionable, but he's a great it's character. A yeah, he's very uh, entertaining, you know, like, and you really love to hate him. And I think you do a really good job of, yeah, like, um, you know, like the people are always worse, you know, in these stories than the, the supernatural thing. And I think there's a really cool contrast there too, you know, because like right off the bat, like, um, you know, I don't want to give too much away about like what's going on here, but like there is the implication though that like the hungers like there's an agreement there. They can abide by agreements, which means that they have like values and principles and things, and they can like you know. But Cyril does not. You know, he's a, he's a mercenary and um, a Pinkerton too, right? Like, which is awful. And <laughs> so, like, um, you know, he is a lot less civilized than the you know the other forces at work in this story. So how do you kind of balance like the human horror and the creature horror? It's basically I take one to kind of support the other. Like um, the idea that it's kind of, you know, human hunger that feeds in 
to the creatures from the hungers like con like you know the, the contrast between them the creatures from the hungers you know once again without giving anything away they can be reasoned with they are not uh, mindless monsters they do have their own codes but they are still remnants of a very dangerous society and a dangerous land and even you know even when they're functioning as protectors it's kind of implied like you know the heroes do not really want them around and they're actually kind of scared because they can't really control them it's only the uh it's only the idea it's only like their sense of propriety that keeps them in line like these things are fast they're strong they're they're da they're very dangerous and there's only really so much you can do to control them on the other hand um Cyril is someone who can only be controlled if you're paying him. Like the idea of, you know, just just my idea was when I had him in mind, I really had him. Um, I you know when I kind of cast him in my head, it, I, I really thought of Richard Drake when I was writing all his dialogue, like that slow drawl, that you know really uh, like he he was just the actor I really had in my head there. Sometimes I'm able to cast him, sometimes I'm not. But you know, <laughs> Cyril is someone who would be like a great guy to go out for a drink with he would you know buy so he would probably buy you rounds be a lot of fun to talk to and if there was even like ten dollars in it for him he cut your throat and never think twice about it <laughs> yeah like some, like you know Cyril is a character who i think is you know an effective horror villain i i you know i actually had a lot of people comment on Cyril in some reviews basically saying like you know this guy is very human but he's just like such a bad person he has like all these reasons to be grateful to these people he has all these reasons and all these considerations of time he just kind of like almost seems like he could be a better person and then goes back on it. And I just really, really love that. Like the idea of like, this is a guy who he'll be hired by someone super wealthy who you cannot possibly match the price of. And his jobs just make you disappear. Like you never existed. Um, <clears throat> the idea of if you never, if you ever, um, even if, even if he owes you a favor, then that's you know completely negotiable. He'll he'll just take that and use that as a bargaining tool elsewhere. And he's someone who you know it might be a little ahistorical, but I, I I really wanted to make sure that Cyril was not a very you know racist or sexist or even anti-Semitic person. He's kind of beyond that. Like he just sees everyone as a potential for a profit. Like he does like you know. Um, I'm sure that he does, you know, obviously he would hold some of the prejudices of the day, but he is, but he makes it very clear everything there is secondary to money. And why does he want the money? Just because he wants it. He can't explain it. It's just something that's part of him. And that, you know, he's, you know, basically, I, I mean, also made it clear, he's not a very abusive boss. He's a good, you know, he, like, I, I think when I portray him as a leader, he's a relatively good one. Like, you know, he's not into just randomly abusing his men. He's not, you know, he he's make sure everyone gets to share the profits. There's no altruism to it. Everything he does is just calculated and you can just attach dollar signs to his eyes and it wouldn't change anything else about him. Mm -hmm. And that is like, to me, scarier in a way than like an outright racist or bigot or something, because at least like when you, when somebody has an ideology, they can like be predicted to some extent, you know, like if you don't believe in anything and just money, like, you know, that there's no way to sort of like grapple with that. It makes them very scary. And like, you find yourself as a reader, like, yeah, feeling very torn about like being terrified of him, but also just like finding him immensely entertaining at the same time. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about like how you in this book, um, in a very short uh, span, because I keep saying book, but it is a novella. Um, you have a lot of really good character work, like the story has a lot of heart, but there's like a lot of really good, like slick action plotting too. And so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about like how you approach action as opposed to character and how do you create like the balance of that? You know, it's, um, I find that the best action takes place when you care about the characters who are involved in it. Like, um, the first scene is, I tried to use it, is, you know, the first uh, scene in the book um, is a flashback to Antietam, which is Cyril and Esther's father, Abraham, when they're in the same foxhole together. Um, that was something, you know, obviously I'm using that to introduce the characters, but I'm using that to introduce the characters, to get their mindsets, to um, get their characters through that, to kind of make you, um, you know, get basically so the reader gets to know them and also they don't know what to expect. Um, you know, basically, it's introducing the idea that Cyril owes Abraham his life, um, but also introducing the idea that Cyril is very wily as well. And, and then, you know, um, I think it's all a matter of pacing in that sense, like some quiet drama scenes after that, character development. 
and action when it's appropriate. You know, he, um, I'm someone who writes, um, I kind of like to, you know, what's called pantsing, obviously. I like to, you know, I sit down, I have some ideas of where I want to go, but I'll just kind of like figure it out as I get there. And, you know, um, Rath James White once said that, you know, he likes to kind of do the same thing, but he likes to keep himself excited when he's writing. Like, you know, so I want to keep it exciting for myself too. Like I'll throw in like maybe, you know, a fun little action scene there. Like uh, there's a scene where the when the ladies are visiting town and Esther and, you know, Siobhan's idea of fun is go off and get into just a random boxing match. <laughs> um, so I just kind of threw that in there and I'm like, wait, you know, this is fun because, you know, it's, it's an action scene, but also it's telling you about Siobhan as a character. Mm. She's not when they care. She's risky. She likes fighting. She's also very skilled. And it shows Esther's reaction to and after it. Um, so it allowed me to say, you know, that's something that can't, you know, it shows their reactions and it helps build that. And it also helps the reader care about them. So when the dangers actually happen, that, you know, I, I'm hoping the reader is more invested there all the way to the end where, you know, now it's the confrontation. Now it's the, you know, the, the, the final battles. Now, like, you know, the, the horror is happening. Like, you know, hopefully you're on the edge of your seat. There's that suspense that's leading up to it. And, you know, now... I've built the characters up enough that you actually care what's happening to them, that you're cheering for Esther and Siobhan when they're going up against Cyril and the Blackhawks, or, you know, you're worried for them when the creatures from the Hungers are around, and, you know, all um, all basically based on that. And, you know, I, I just have a, I, I just have, I just have a lot of fun with it. And also, you know, writing the, uh, I also just love writing, you know, the dialogue between them, you know, the, uh, but I, some, sometimes some action scenes don't allow so much for dialogue, but I try to, you know, dialogue between them as authentic as possible as you know kind of get kind of get into their heads like how would two people who have been in a relationship essentially their entire lives you know talk to one another um how would like they would obviously be very uncomfortable with one another esther has obviously seen siobhan fight before and has no you know and has no doubt she's good at it um on the other hand you know the way cyril talks to his men and the way cyril talks to other people and how the fighting goes uh and how the fighting you know goes between between Cyril and, you know, without spoiling anything, the fight he has with uh, Abraham and his people. Um, and, you know, I just, basically, I, I have a lot of fun using that to develop the characters and, and the setting. So it's all really a matter of just knowing when to throw something in and make sure the stakes are there. Mm, that's really interesting. Because, you know, I was thinking as I was reading this that, like, it's like this kind of, like, there are stakes that are present, but they are, like, if you compare it to, like, sort of, you know, like Hollywood action blockbuster filmmaking, like the stakes there are always so high as to be like sort of unimaginable or like you can't really connect with them because it's always like fate of the universe, you know? And like in a lot of those fights, you can sort of probably slot out any given person and slot in a different one and the fight still kind of like makes sense and the motivations and things. There's something about like this kind of small scale action where you really do see like not only is the character determining like how they approach the fight and what they do and what choices they make but then that like the fight and outcome then have implications for character development you know and affect how they go how they act going forward and it just feels like it's a much more organic approach to action than I think you see in a lot of modern stuff and I really appreciated that <laughs> yeah I appreciate that it's also kind of you know one thing I also wanted to consider was the different ways they would fight like you know what are their characters what are their styles what you know um I introduced the idea that Abraham was a, you know, Abraham was a boxer and he taught Siobhan. Um, how would they, you know, f like how, how would they fight against uh, this opponent? Like um, I remember um, one thing I, one thing I had is a lot of the fights don't even last that long. They're just very, you know, brief and brutal. And you try to make sure you put the other person down and make sure they stay down. Yeah. That makes total sense, you know, because I think like in, in modern fights, you do see you do see a lot of people like throwing people across the room and stuff. And it's like that doesn't accomplish anything. You know, like people usually want these things to end as fast as possible. <laughs> so it felt very real. Um, yeah, I enjoyed this book so much and I really can't wait to see uh, what you do next. And I know it's often difficult to talk about, you know, what's on the horizon. But do you have anything that you're in, in the works or that you're working on that you can speak to a little bit? Absolutely, I, I I would love to actually. Um, I do have a few things that are signed for now that I can talk about. There's um, three more books that I have that are signed for that are uh, coming up relatively soon. Um, one is coming up actually next month. Uh, my publisher just put out a trailer for it. It's with Off Limits Press, who have done amazing books like uh, Haley Piper's uh, The Worm and His Kings and the recent sequel. Yes. Um, Laurel Hightower's Crossroads. Uh, J. W. McCarthy's Sleep Alone. 
a book by Tim McGregor and Caitlin McCarthy, amazing publisher. I've really been honored and humbled to work with them. Um, they put out a call for a pulp line, and one of my one of my pitches was accepted, and the book has been signed for. It is coming out next month. It is a Jewish pulp detective horror novel called The Long Shalom. Nice. <laughs> fantastic so thank you baby <laughs> it is now up for pre-order we just um we just got the um we just got the uh the the pre-order link up we have the uh you know the uh, the book trailer is up um it is the the cover was recently released and it is um kind of, you know th there might be a few little easter eggs and hunger in there i'm not really sure if i should call them easter eggs with the, with the you know jewish connection but um but yeah, no, I'm really excited about that. Um, it's about a Jewish detective in Prohibition era, and people are going missing in New York City. People the cops wouldn't usually miss, and he is contacted by his old flame who knocks on the door one night, and she contracts him for a job to find some missing folks. And he ends up with like an old team of his who are all, you know, minorities of various stripes and, uh, you know, various stripes and sorts to get to the bottom of it. And there's cosmic horror and things that aren't quite human. Ooh. Um, and I have, um, it might be November, we might be delaying it a bit for some other stuff, but it is a Jewish pirate horror novel with Dark Lit Press, which I have just finished and turned in, so we'll be editing it soon, nice. called Devils and the Deep Blue Sea, set during the Golden Age of Piracy. Ooh. And it is, I would pitch that as a mix between The Vigil, Evil Dead, and Black Sails, Ooh. where you have ghosts of you know wrath you have like a whole pirate crew worth of dibbics who are hunting a jewish sailor along the waves for revenge and also to unlock like the dark secrets of the depths oh, wow. and i have one other that we should be releasing next year with the same publisher from hungers which is a like a jewish gothic horror novel called um the unquiet grave which i kind of pitched as carmilla meets the vigil meets crimson peak Oh my gosh, these are also great. <laughs> it, is a, it is a Jewish uh, woman who is fresh out of Paris who has just married a count and she arrives at his new estate and things seem happy except there is a creature that is haunting the grounds who she turns out to have a lot in common with. Oh, wow. It's really cool to see. I look forward to reading all of these because I am really looking forward to see uh, the Jewish perspective work through all these genres and especially I'm so glad that you mentioned the visual twice because I love the visual like that was so um, so good <laughs> it, but there hasn't been a Jewish horror movie like it like before or after like um, I, I like there's a lot of really good ones like well not a lot a lot but um, I would recommend seeing 2018's The Golem if you haven't I recommend seeing um, Attachment was was good but the vigil is you know that's when you that's like what happens when you take someone who like really like that, that that's a movie with like a, a, a like almost completely a jewish team and that like just really showed like um when they show like you know the like the let's get serious moment where he's rapping to fill in i was like oh my god this, this is my movie and that that was a big uh that that was a big influence on me um i i that that one like was really like my jewish horror thing like i, I absolutely love like i absolutely love that movie too so cool. Well, thank you again so much for coming to talk to us. I am so excited for the world to read this book and all the ones that are coming. And, you know, if in uh, the fall, if you want to come back to talk about uh, this gothic book, uh, you're welcome back because that sounds really fabulous, too. <laughs> I would absolutely love I'd absolutely love to. I would also mention uh, if anyone wants to check it out. I also have one other gothic horror one, which just came out in Diet Milk magazine called The Blackest Heart. Ooh. which is about a Jewish countess in the, uh, I forget what century, but it's in like pre-unification Italy where she is married to a, you know, handsome count and she learns he is leading an evil cult that is trying to summon a demon. And she is left to basically figure her way out of it. And her maid seems to have some secrets. And, you know, it was really sweet. Diet Milk actually sent me a message saying, you know, hey, we love your story. Would you like to do a, would you like to do sequels to it? And we will happily serialize that. And I was like, absolutely so i have that coming oh wow that sounds cool too well yeah you are welcome to come back and discuss any and all of these they all sound fabulous I'll, thank you so I much love, i would absolutely love, I'll, I'll be happy to send you a, a arc of a long shalom as well hey thank you <laughs> my absolute pleasure all right listeners please pick up this book hungers as old as this land 
is absolutely fantastic. And by the time that you hear this, it will be available. So please, please seek it out. Um, this has been Jen. It's been lovely having you. And I'll see you all next time. It's time to close this chapter. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode. Thank you.